Parsha 39, Hukat. Turn to Numbers chapter 19. Adonai said to Moshe and Aharon, This is the regulation from the Torah, which Adonai has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a young red female cow without fault or defect, and which has never borne a yoke. You are to give it to Eliezer the Kohen. It is to be brought outside the camp and slaughtered in front of him. Eliezer the Kohen is to take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle this blood towards the front of the tent of meeting seven times. The heifer is to be burned to ashes before his eyes. Its skin, meat, blood, and dung is to be burned to ashes. The Kohen is to take cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet yarn and throw them onto the heifer as it is burning up. Then the Kohen is to wash his clothes and himself in water, after which he may re-enter the camp. But the Kohen will remain unclean until evening. The person who burned up the heifer is to wash his clothes and himself in water, but he will remain unclean until evening. A man who is clean is to collect the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place. They are to be kept for the community of the people of Israel to prepare water for purification from sin. The one who collected the ashes of the heifer is to wash his clothes and be unclean until evening. For the people of Israel and for the foreigner staying with them, this will be a permanent regulation. Anyone who touch, touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, will be unclean for seven days. He must purify himself with these ashes on the third and seventh days. Then he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself the third and seventh days, he will not be clean. Anyone who touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, and does not purify himself, has defiled the tabernacle of Adonai. That person will be cut off from Israel, because the water for purification was not sprinkled on him. He will be unclean. His uncleanness is still on him. This is the law. When a person dies in a tent, everyone who enters the tent and everything in the tent will be unclean for seven days. Every open container without a cover closely attached is unclean. Also, whoever is in an open field and touches a corpse, whether of someone killed by a weapon or of someone who died naturally, or the bone of a person, or a grave, will be unclean for seven days. For the unclean person, they are to take some of the ashes of the animal burned up as a purification from sin and add them to fresh water in a container. A clean person is to take a bunch of hyssop leaves, dip it in the water, and sprinkle it on the tent, on all the containers, on the people who were there, and on the person who touched the bone, or the person killed, or the one who died naturally, or the grave. The clean person will sprinkle the unclean person on the third and seventh days. On the seventh day he will purify him. Then he will wash his clothes and himself in water, and he will be clean at evening. The person who remains unclean and does not purify himself will be cut off from the community because he has defiled the sanctuary of Adonai. The water for purification has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. This is to be a permanent regulation for them. The person who sprinkles the water for purification is to wash his clothes. Whoever touches the water for purification will be unclean until evening. Anything the unclean person touches will be unclean, and anyone who touches him will be unclean until evening. The people of Israel, the whole community, entered the Sin Desert in the first month, and they stayed in Kadesh. There Miriam died, and there she was buried. Because the community had no water, they assembled themselves against Moshe and Aharon. The people quarreled with Moshe and Aharon and said, We wish we had died when our brothers died before Adonai. Why did you bring Adonai's community into this desert? To die there, we and our livestock? Why did you make us leave Egypt? To bring us to this terrible place without seed, figs, grapevines, pomegranates, or even water to drink? Moshe and Aharon left the assembly, went to the entrance of the tent of meeting, and fell on their faces, and the glory of Adonai appeared to them. Adonai said to Moshe, Take the staff, assemble the community, you and Aharon your brother, and before their eyes, 
tell the rock to produce its water. You will bring them water out of the rock, and thus enable the community and their livestock to drink. Moshe took the staff from the presence of Adonai as he had ordered him. But after Moshe and Aharon had assembled the community in front of the rock, he said to them, Listen here, you rebels. Are we supposed to bring you water from this rock? Then Moshe raised his hand and hit the rock twice with his staff. Water flowed out in abundance, and the community and their livestock drank. But Adonai said to Moshe and Aharon, Because you did not trust in me, so as to cause me to be regarded as holy by the people of Israel, you will not bring this community into the land I have given them. This is Miravah Spring, where the people of Israel disputed with Adonai, and he was caused to be regarded as holy by them. Moshe sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. This is what your brother Israel says. You know all the troubles we have gone through, that our ancestors went down into Egypt. We lived in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians treated us and our ancestors badly. But when we cried out to Adonai, he heard us, sent an angel, and brought us out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh, a city at the edge of your territory. Please let us pass through your land. We will not go through fields or vineyards, and we won't drink any water from the wells. We will go along the king's highway, not turning aside either to the right or to the left, until we have left your territory. But Edom answered, You are not to pass through my land. If you do, I will come out against you with the sword. The people of Israel replied, We will keep to the highway. If we do drink the water, either we or our livestock, we will pay for it. Just let us pass through on foot. It's nothing. But he said, You are not to pass through. And Edom came out against them with many people and much force. Thus Edom refused to allow Israel passage through its territory, so Israel turned away. They traveled on from Kadesh, and the people of Israel, the whole community, arrived at Mount Hor. At Mount Hor, by the border of the land of Edom, Adonai said to Moshe and Aharon, Aharon is about to be gathered to his people, because he is not to enter the land I have given to the people of Israel, inasmuch as you have rebelled against what I said at the Mirabah spring. Take Aharon and Eliezer his son, bring them up to Mount Hor, remove the garments from Aharon, and put them on Eliezer his son. Aharon will be gathered to his people. He will die there. Moshe did as Adonai ordered. They went up to Mount Hor before the eyes of the whole community. Moshe removed the garments from Aharon and put them on Eliezer his son, and Aharon died there on top of the mountain. Then Moshe and Eliezer came down the mountain. When the entire community saw that Aharon was dead, they mourned Aharon thirty days, the whole house of Israel. Then the king of Arad, a Canaanite who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was approaching by the way of the Adarim. So he attacked Israel and took some of them captive. Amen. Okay. You know, <laughs> there's so many directions we could go with today's Torah portion. So many valuable lessons for us to follow uh, as, as, as followers of Yehovah. But we only have time to explore one of them. And we're going to concentrate mainly on what we learned today in Numbers chapter 20. Now, before we go any further, let me explain. This parasha, because of the way it works, would have gone on for another three or four chapters. All right. And so we decided to show you mercy. All right. And not read on for another 15, 20 more minutes. So that's why we stopped where we did. Well, as we've seen often in the journey of the Israelites, once again, they find themselves in need of water. And when we remember that we're talking about the water needs of as many as three million people, plus their large herds and flocks of livestock, the problem simply cannot be solved by discovering merely naturally occurring water sources in the middle of a desert. But once again, they go to Moses, they demand to know what he's going to do about it. And once again, they openly express their distress, their unhappiness at being let out into a barren place because despite their lives of oppression 
in Egypt from which God rescued them. In Egypt, at least they had sufficient food and, more pertinent to the story, plenty of water. Living along the Nile meant they never thirsted for enough water. Well, not knowing what else to do after facing this ungrateful, disgruntled, angry mob, Aaron and Moses go to the wilderness tabernacle. There they fall on their faces in worship, seeking the counsel of the Lord, which was exactly the right thing to do. Now, not surprisingly, Jehovah appears to them and he speaks. And the gist of the conversation is that Aaron is to take his rod, that is the staff, that's that one that budded, and walk over to some conspicuous rock formation that was nearby. And there they were to assemble the community of Israel together as witness to what was about to happen. Now, opinions differ on this, but I see Israel as probably now in its third year in the wilderness. Jehovah has provided them with water. He's provided them with good tasting, nutritious food that literally just falls from the sky in enormous amounts. Enough for all, no toil, no effort on their part, except to take baskets and gather it. And with every other need to sustain their lives has been provided. Yet, the people grumble, and they doubt, and many of them long to go back to where they came from. And especially after their awesome experience at the Holy Mountain, that which took place two years earlier or a little more, where God made Himself so vividly known to them, why did the Israelites turn in despair to their human leader, not in hopeful expectation to their divine deliverer? Well, the question is one that plagues believers all the days of our lives. Why is prayer and supplication to the Father often the second, maybe even the, the last place that we turn to in times of need and trouble? Or that we think it better that we not approach God, but rather someone else does it for us in our stead? You know, while there's no single answer to those questions, I think the underlying reason for all the reasons is that despite what we may claim, we don't truly believe or trust God. See, these Israelite refugees, despite their universal declaration on Mount Sinai of all that Jehovah says we will do, they didn't believe God, at least not to any kind of deep, sincere level. And yet, we need to be cautious in drawing too close of a parallel between them and us. In my mind, they had far more excuse for not believing God than we do. We who have been believers for a few years. See, this is because we have something they didn't have. We have God's Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Those ancient Israelites didn't even know who God was until He sent Moses and delivered them from Egypt. Then a few weeks later, when at Mount Sinai, the Lord gave them His Torah, His law, their permanent, never-changing moral code for living. Being but two years removed from this meant that Israel was still in its infancy to knowing God, who God is through their experiences with Him. At this time, they were still far more Egyptian than they were set apart Israel. They still viewed most things through the lens of their Egyptian historical past. I mean, Egypt was still the only homeland they had known for 20 generations. Canaan, the promised land, well, it wasn't just remote, it was only a theory. It was a promise that was nearly impossible for them to visualize and internalize as entirely real. 
The reality is it was going to take 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years of experience God's love and care, and of experiencing far more failures in their personal and corporate trials of faith than successes, before Jehovah determined they were finally ready enough to receive their promised inheritance. Canaan. Think about it. Nearly 500 new moon observances had to pass. 500. Before these formerly Hebrew Egyptians were reborn as Hebrew Israelites as they crossed through the waters of the Jordan River. See, it's a similar life and faith journey of every follower of Yeshua. When we first came to trust in Christ, and in the first several years that followed that moment, well, at least the majority of us remain more worldly than becoming more godly. We failed more. We doubted more. We believed less. We knew less than after several years of seeking after God and trusting in His truth and just plain living life. That is mainly because not enough time had passed yet for us to grow and to learn through actual experience. God knows that. He accepts that of us. However, He does expect us to grow. He expects us, over time, to correct our ways through acquiring more knowledge and experience as time passes. Therefore, at Meribah, when Moses struck the rock, instead of doing as God commanded and water poured forth, God did not punish or chastise young, inexperienced Israel for their lack of faith in Him. He punished Moses and his brother Aaron, whom he had specially prepared and whom he had directly instructed about what to do, but who also failed. A growing faith is reflected by a growing trust, a growing belief in what he instructs us. And that growing trust and belief is reflected by the decisions we make, by the actions we take. Yeshua's brother James addresses this exact issue as he addresses those who claim to have faith in Messiah Yeshua, but oh, they behave quite differently. In James 2.14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone claims to have faith but has no actions to prove it? That faith is that faith able to save him? Then a few verses more in verse 20. But foolish fellow, do you want to be shown that such faith, apart from your actions, is barren? So, with some honest introspection, don't raise your hands or respond. Does your life actually reflect your belief in Jesus? That's a hard one, isn't it? Considering the times in which we live, do you sense, do you really believe that the end times have probably arrived or is so very near? But you have done little, if any, of spiritual and tangible value to prepare for it? Have you taken practical steps to provide for your family when food, when supplies needed for basic life just suddenly become scarce because it's prophesied that's what's going to happen? You know, if, my friend, you have not, then you're going to have to ask yourself if you truly do believe what you claim you believe. It's not just James, but also Paul and nearly every other inspired Bible writer states without wavering, true belief must be accompanied with relevant action 
or it's not actual belief. I want to give you an example of what I'm getting at. Let's say if you were told that a terrorist had planted a nuclear bomb in your community and that is going to be set off at noon tomorrow and that there is no hope of finding it and stopping it in time, would you pack up and leave as quickly as you could? Or would you go right on living as before? You know, kind of waiting to see if it's all going to work out. Still going to work. Your children still going to school. Now, I totally believe that few here would likely ignore that warning. Because you actually believe it. As opposed to being a little skeptical about it. You would indeed take action. Of course you would. You would leave as quickly as possible. See, belief plus action is the definition of what the Bible means to believe. Just as listen plus act is the true biblical definition of hearing. Moses did as he was told by God because he believed God, but even that belief was an imperfect belief. He took the rod, he went to the rock, and then proceeded to speak very harshly to the people. Basically, he says, you know, you always come griping to me. You expect me to handle everything for you. Somehow or another, even in a place where there is no water, I'm supposed to try to just manufacture it for you, to fix these problems as though I made them all in the first place. Then he turns, and what does he do? He whacks that rock with Arad's staff twice, and out flowed apparently enormous volumes of water. Well, the people were sure happy enough. Uh, turns out the Lord didn't feel the same way about it. He informs Moses and Aaron that because they did not affirm God's sanctity in front of the Israelite community, then neither of them are going to enter the Promised Land. We have no record of a response or a reaction from Moses or Aaron, but one can only imagine their shock and their depression at this immovable edict of God. Now, anyone studying this might ask himself, why? Why such a harsh decree from the Lord to the very two men who he has used, in some degree used up, to achieve his purposes? What is it exactly that Moses and Aaron did that would bring this sort of wrath from God upon them? Well, the obvious is that Moses disobeyed God. He hit the rock that he was only supposed to verbally order to produce water, even though in a previous incident, hitting the rock to produce water is what he was told to do. But this seems so small a thing in comparison to the drastic consequences. In God's eyes, however, their offense was very serious. In Deuteronomy, in recalling this event, we read in Deuteronomy 32, verses 49 through 52 Go up into the Avarim range to Mount Nebo, into the land of Moab, across from Jericho, and look out over the land of Canaan, which I am giving the people of Israel as a possession. On the mountain you are ascending, you will die. You will be gathered to your people, just as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people." The reason for this is that both of you broke faith with me there among the people of Israel at Meravat Kadesh Spring in the Zin Desert. You failed to demonstrate my holiness there among the people of Israel. So you will see the land from a distance but you will not enter the land I'm giving to the people of Israel. 
in truth, there have been many theories put forth by great Jewish scholars over the centuries to explain this devastating retribution uh, upon Moses and Aaron. And among those theories are these, that by striking the rock twice instead of once, that's why, and that's based on a belief of some of them that the two mentions in the Torah of, of Moses obtaining water from a rock are actually just one. Another view is that this ungodly character flaw was displayed. A blazing temper caused Moses to care little for a very real need of the people, water, and thus saw the matter as mostly a bother to him personally. Yet another is that he doubted God and thus God told him exactly that, because you did not trust in me. And of course the most accepted explanation is that he struck the rock instead of speaking to it as he was ordered. So. How are we to understand this? I think that the matter primarily comes down to an attitude that Moses displayed in front of Israel in which, unintentionally or not, he used and validated a pagan belief that was held by these Israelites that was the same as all people of that era. And in doing so, he failed to show God as the one who brings forth the water not a man. See, we have to remember that Israel was just a few months, 35, 36, 37 months from Egypt. They behaved, they thought more as Egyptians than Israelites, deep-seated in their consciousness was the acceptance of magic and of sorcerers, men who possessed special powers that were that was loaned to them by the gods. So sorcerers invariably made quite a show of it. No, they used these incantations that, that were accompanied by all sorts of dramatic gestures when they were doing their magic. Pretty good show. And naturally, these magicians were greatly feared. They were revered for their powers that they claimed to possess. Now Moses and Aaron essentially took credit for the miracle of water coming forth from the rock. In fact, and the way they behaved, they implied it was by their power that this amazing thing happened. Verse 10 says, Listen here, you rebels. Are we, Moses and Aaron, supposed to bring you water from this rock? Then he turns around and strikes the rock. Water gushed forth. I mean, what else were the people to think? but that it was Moses and Aaron had great supernatural powers. Some of the great Hebrew sages say that this great sin resulted from Moses saying, Notzi, meaning, shall we draw forth, when what he should have said was, Yotzi, meaning, shall he draw forth. By saying Notzi, Moses was giving credit to himself and to Aaron as though they had the power of sorcerers to call forth water from a rock, instead of directing all honor and glory to Jehovah, who is the one with the power. See, the result of this rash public indiscretion is it reflected very badly on God. Thus, the Lord says in chapter 20, Numbers chapter 20, verse 12, But Adonai said to Moses and to Aaron, Because you did not trust in me, so as to cause me to be regarded as holy by the people of Israel. The water being miraculously provided for the people from an inert rock should have been yet another opportunity for God to display His mercy, His love, his unlimited ability to care for his own, as well as his immutable uniqueness, apart from men, apart from other gods. The sanctity 
that should have been his alone became muddled in the minds of those who could have greatly benefited from the lesson that among the Hebrews there will be no sorcery or sorcerers. God wanted to show that He stood alone, distinct, apart from any other being, but instead Moses and Aaron attempted to show themselves as being distinct and apart from Israel. They showed themselves as inherently possessing many of the powers of Jehovah. And since God was denied His due in the miracle of the water from the rock, Moses and Aaron will be denied their due from being the leaders of Israel. For when verse 12 was completed, it says, You will not bring this community into the land I have given to them. What a huge warning this is, especially to those who hold themselves up as God's representatives and leaders of His congregation of believers on earth. I mean, how many pastors, rabbis, teachers, prophets claim or imply a power and a special ability or a special holiness of their own to be used at their own discretion, when in fact they have no power, inherent power. I have no inherent power. I have no special holiness. Or they claim personal credit for what actually are acts of God. You know, some time ago, I heard a TV pastor who was trolling for funds for his ministry say that if people would send him a thousand dollars, he would covenant with them through the airwaves and vow a threefold return in their investment to his ministry. He was proudly saying he had the spiritual power and the spiritual connections to cause God to miraculously give you back $3,000 if you'd send $1,000 to support his particular ministry. I want to be very clear on this crucial lesson, lesson from our Divine Lord. Moses and Aaron's penalty for displaying such a haughty attitude and for misleading people into thinking, thinking something that is simply not the truth, for trying to rob God of His due glory, is that they were never allowed to enter the Promised Land. If men of such great position and stature, men who were afforded by God with the highest level of holiness that humans could ever achieve on earth, if they were not allowed entry into the promised land because of the type of sin they committed, even if to them the offense was so small, how could any of us decline to teach, demonstrate, or live divine truth. And worse, worse, that we might misappropriate God's glory and merit for ourselves. How could we expect to enter the great spiritual promised land of eternal rest with our Lord if this happened to Moses and Aaron? You see, it ought to be enough for us all that God loves us, that He hears our prayers, that He shows us His mercy in marvelous ways every single day. He acts on our behalf probably way more often than we have any realization of it. Even Yeshua, our Messiah, who Himself was divine, never attempted to misappropriate to His own glory that which belonged to His Father. He ascribed all of His miracles, all of His accomplishments, what He knew, what He was sent to do to His Father. He directed all prayers 
all praise to his Father. Then Yeshua left this earth telling his disciples, that's us, to be like him. So, let's us together determine to do just that. Would you please rise? For more teaching and information, visit us online today. Come and be a part of our fellowship. Here at The Seed, enjoy worshiping and learning God's Word with us.